Brock Lesnar's big return match for the WWE didn't happen at WrestleMania, it didn't happen at the Royal Rumble, it didn't happen at SummerSlam, it happened at a so-called B pay-per-view known as Extreme Rules. And did anybody care? No, they did not, because it was flipping awesome. Returning with way more star power than he had before, mostly because he had gone to UFC and become a UFC world champion, he returned to the business with one thing in mind, and that was to make a hell of a lot of money, which is why he was able to work himself into one of the most lucrative wrestling deals in history, where it was like, hey Brock, you can just work like one day a year and we will pay you $32 million. The best part of all of this though, was how huge he felt, because current fan lost it, fans that haven't watched for a while, they lost it, and even MMA fans were like peeking their head round the door, because they wanted to see what on earth he was going to do. And surely this was all gonna be so simple. He could come in, he could could destroy everybody, he could stand on top of the world before eventually some young up-and-comer with all the potential defeated him and the circle of life would continue, otherwise Mufasa died for nothing. And yeah, look, we did kind of do that. It just took a long way to get there. Rumours also kicked into gear instantly that at WrestleMania in 2013 we were going to do Brock versus Rock and you absolutely know that there was some truth in that because you couldn't get through a 24 hour period without somebody going, oh I've heard that Vince McMahon is interesting doing Brock versus Rock and it would have been awesome but for one reason or another we just couldn't get it done. The other question of course is why Lesnar decided to return here because there had been plenty of opportunities beforehand, especially in 2010 when he just had that UFC fight and he walked past The Undertaker who went, you want to do it? That was all supposed to be a build for a WrestleMania match between those two. But when Dana White found out about it, he was like, I don't think so. He belongs to the Ultimate Fighting Championship. He ain't doing no wrestling crap. In 2011, there was even more noise that WWE was happy to offer him a limited date schedule and pay him $5 million a year. Without wanting to get you very upset, that does seem to be what happened when he did return on that Raw after WrestleMania in 2012. At the very least, it was touted as the highest annual guaranteed wrestler contract ever for somebody in WWE. And I don't know about you, but when you get to those kind of terms, I'd love my name to be associated with that. It means you're about to earn Scrooge McDuck money. Just for some more trivia too, officials actually thought about having Brock Lesnar return after the Rock vs. Cena match that had happened at WrestleMania the night before, and him to both look at them like, oh, I'm back, what are you gonna do? Until everyone realized, wait a minute, isn't it just enough having the Rock vs. John Cena in a match and having a winner and a loser? And that's why it got shifted to Raw. As ever, fans knew all about this beforehand and they were just screaming Brock Lesnar's name throughout the evening. But even then, when his music did hit and he came out, they lost their damn minds and don't you worry about it, I was losing mine too. All of this as well was coming off that once in a lifetime match that The Rock and John Cena would then go on to do again. And you had that badass Triple H versus The Undertaker match. So you can see why WWE needed or wanted something here. They actually had some momentum. You don't want to let it die. And then they kind of did that <laughs> at Extreme Rules. Well, let's not worry about that. And instead, let's take the finger of power and up those downs for Extreme Rules 2012. The best part about the whole show, potentially, but obviously not really, is the video that plays at the start because you get a reminder about all those Brock Lesnar promos that he had been cutting backstage where they just stuck a camera in his face and said, Brock, please talk. All this nonsense that Brock Lesnar can't cut promos, he has, you just have to find the right setting, and this was absolutely that. It also then reminded me of that blood, urine, vomit promo that Brock would cut a couple of years later when he once again was taken on John Cena. And at that moment I realized, Brock Lesnar is so good. I don't care what you say, you can disagree with me, oh he just runs away with the title all the time. Well maybe he does, but I think he's flipping faboo. Come at me. Now obviously most of the matches on this card were going to have a stipulation of some kind because it was called Extreme Rules. But when I do sit down to watch retro events, my brain is staying in 2021 because that's where I currently live. And due to that, I was very surprised when the opener went Randy Orton taking on Kane in a Fool's Count Anywhere contest. Oh, that one. I didn't see that coming, but it's good enough. Kane was also back in his mask, which always makes me happy because it's always Mask Kane over no Mask Kane. And the very first thing they start doing is hitting each other with a pipe. And that made me chuckle because out of context, you had no idea what was going on. But it was because in the build, not only had Kane attacked Randy Orton's dad, Bob, with a pipe, but then Randy Orton had attacked Kane's dad, Paul Bearer, using said pipe. Why not use a pipe here? They both go nuts when they are on outside and hit drop kicks on each other, even though there's just concrete waiting below to break their fall, especially when Kane does it. 
Kane is like nine foot four, I don't think he wants to be falling on no asphalt. I did burst out laughing again, however, when these two do get backstage, because the big red machine from nowhere is attacked by Zack Ryder. Once again, out of context, you're like, who is this maniac who has decided to try and beat up this huge dude? Especially because the huge dude no sells this, he may as well have been striking him with a pillow. And I thought to myself, poor, poor Zack Ryder, he never stood a chance, especially because, of course, this was around the time that Kane had put him in a wheelchair and thrown him off the stage. He never got that. There is a horrendous chair shot by Randy Orton that is so vicious it will take years off of your life, and the finish is actually kind of cool, because Kane is going to tombstone Randy Orton onto a chair, Randy reverses it, hits the RKO, one, two, three, he is over. Also shows how much Kane had changed as a persona here. Nobody would have ever let him lost like this back in like 1997, 1998, and really, you only ever need to watch this match once, Although technically it's my second time of watching it, so I suppose once every nine years is fine. I'll see you in 2030. Which is the most bizarre segment once again because of context after this, because Eve Torres and brand new GM John Laurinaitis are just backstage drinking champagne before Teddy Long, who is now their butler or something, comes in with the world's biggest name tag. I mean, honestly, it's bigger than my head and it's just being all nicey nice, even though in his face, you can see that he's broken. And you never get a payoff here. Like you get an interview with him later. He just goes, well, I had to go talk to the game and he was really nice. What a strange time this was. What was also strange was Brodus Clay versus Dolph Ziggler. As it turned out, this was never actually advertised for the pay-per-view, so why wouldn't you do that? Who the hell needs more of a buy rate? And of course, Brodus Clay comes out with Hornswoggle, who's like little Brodus, because every time we had to do something within WWE, somebody just went and got Hornswoggle. I mean, what didn't he do? There's also the time when Vicky Guerrero is associated with Dolph Ziggler, and she comes out and does that whole thing, and it makes you want to rip your own head off. And also, Jack Swagger is here in a very nice suit and tie, and he's also a friend of Dolphy Boy Blue. And the only real reason to watch this is if you want a reminder about how WWE dropped the ball with Dolph Ziggler. Now I get it's an Illinois crowd, but they are in love with this man. They go crazy for every single thing that he does. They are just desperate for him to be a star. And you know how it went as well. Dolph threw himself around the ring and sold like he was a fish out of water before Brodus Clay just hit a splash and beat him. One, two, three. I didn't get anything out of this aside from sad memories. Down. And we were then spinning the wheel. Do you remember that? I mean, I guess technically they did it on NXT recently, but I think we should bring it back to be the Raw Smackdown or a pay-per-view like this. I mean, it's nonsense. Two wrestlers are about to put their lives on the line and we're going to figure out how by spinning a damn wheel as if it's a game show. But here it is, Big Show versus Cody Rhodes for the Intercontinental title. And it turns out it's going to be a tables match and Big Show goes, ha, ha, ha. You can't throw a giant through a table. And Cody's like, man, this is crap. I tell you what, too, I cannot see Cody in this era without a wry smile just cracking on my face. Because imagine you had gone up to anyone in 2012 and gone, you've seen that guy. One day, he is going to start a wrestling revolution, which is going to give birth to a major wrestling promotion that is a competitor to WWE. You would have been stabbed in the face because the person you were telling this to wouldn't have been able to deal with this. Also, this match is somewhat infamous in WWE history because it does feature that finish which divides people right down the middle. And just to get it out there as quickly as I can, I think it's great and it's getting it up. And basically what happened here is that WWE played very strict and very literal with the rules. For example, in the Royal Rumble, both your feet have to touch the floor. So if one touches, you're still in. And here, as long as you forcibly get put through a table, that's it, you're done, you're out. And it's what goes down with the big show. Because beforehand, Cody does a disaster kick off another table, which does look cool. But when he forces Big Show to the outside, he kind of gives him a knock. Big Show just goes off balance, but because there's a table on the floor, he steps through it. And the ref looks around like, well, you know, that's a technicality. And it costs Big Show the match. He loses the IC belt. Cody is the new champ. So no, it wasn't a crazy bump or anything like that. But honestly, go through every single tables match you've ever seen. All you do is get crazy bumps. This was thinking outside the box. This was allowing pro wrestling to be pro wrestling. I think we should give it 72,000 ticks. Cody was elated. The big show looked like he left the oven on. He was all like, and he thought his house was going to go burn down. And you know what happened afterwards. Big show then had to wreck Cody because you can't give the man anything. And he throws him through two tables. But honestly, do we remember this now more than we would have done otherwise? The answer is, of course we do. Always be creative, 
it is so much more fun. Daniel Bryan was then just being Daniel Bryan. Like he was still being portrayed as a heel here, but the crowd absolutely loved him, mostly because he said things like this. My beard is more manly than Seamus's beard. That doesn't make any sense. In short though, we are all better for having Daniel Bryan in our lives. And we know that Vince McMahon must think that to a certain degree too, because at Extreme Rules 2012, he was able to put on a match that he flipping loved putting on. Just go to your Google devices right now and type in something like, why did Vince McMahon want to see Daniel Bryan and Sheamus fight so much? He did it all the time. It is kind of more interesting here though, because not only is it two out of three falls match, but Daniel Bryan is the challenger and Sheamus is the champion, and you were just coming off that 18 second loss at WrestleMania, which secretly had lit a fire under Mr. Bryan. It did mean that there was an eerie feeling that one of these falls may have been over in yet another 18 seconds, but thankfully WWE didn't do that. And all of this, I tell you, it is just good pro wrestling. Up. I also think that one day we're going to look back and realize that we took Sheamus for granted. He's far better than we give him credit for. And obviously Daniel Bryan is one of the best ever. But it's the audience here that makes this so good. They are divided right down the middle. Some people are shouting for Daniel Bryan's beard. The rest are shouting for Sheamus' beard. It just allows you to plug in. And that was doubly easier because at one point Daniel Bryan dove out the ring towards Sheamus. Who caught him and basically gave him a spine buster into the barricade. I mean, that looked like it sucked. This was also classic Brian as he took Seamus' arm and twisted it around like a pretzel. And at one point, he even yelled at the referee, would you shut up? I know I have a five count. And that made me laugh. Unfortunately, I then think DB forgot this because he went and got himself DQ'd. Because he started to boot Seamus with the yes kicks with the ref saying, would you stop it? You've done too many. Daniel was like, well, I don't want to stop it. So much like we get in the modern day, the referee decided he had seen too much and that was the disqualification. I get that I'm talking about nine years ago now, but I just can't stand this finish. It's so boring down. Also, the other problem is that the theme of this match is that we did not give Daniel Bryan one proper victory. Like, I know he's not going to walk away as the champion, but couldn't we have given him just a little something something? Apparently not. Because even though the champion was all groggy from these kicks, allowing Bryan to apply the yes lock, did Sheamus tap out? Did Sheamus say, oh, I quit, I quit, fella? No. He passed out. So technically, it's now 1-1. One, one. But what I'm talking about, give Daniel Bryan a prize. And then in what was clearly an unfair moment, a bunch of doctors and officials went to tend to Sheamus, meaning that Daniel Bryan wasn't able to carry on his momentum. So it was a screw job from the start, especially because when this all was said and done, Sheamus got up, he hit one bro kick, which did actually result in a cool near fall, but then he hit another, one, two, three, match was done. I don't know why I'm acting so negative. Again, still good. Ryback then destroyed two enhancement talents. I mean, meh. I know sometimes the Ryback does watch What Culture's content because he's yelled at us before. And also, he blocked me on Twitter for a tweet that wasn't about him and just believed what somebody had written in the replies. So I try not to say a lot about him. I'm just going to give it a down. The best part was what was happening backstage. Because Santina Morella was watching this on a TV screen. He called over the great Carly, who plotted up and just went, something, something, something bad. That's what he said. They were the actual words that came out of his mouth. It was like, well, does he not like Ryback? Does he not like wrestling? Has he just had some terrible food? I will never understand what this was. But it was pretty damn entertaining, just because it was so weird. CM Punk had an interview next, and he is ready to go and defend his world championship, especially because they are in Illinois. And then, yeah, you have a street fight between Chris Jericho and CM Punk, the utter hidden doozies that are on Extreme Rules 2012. Up. And yes, it is a street fight, so both guys are wearing jeans. And the only real issue I had with this is the fact it was a street fight. Because do you know what a street fight is like? A Fool's Count Anywhere match. And what do we have to start the show? That. And what do we have here? This. For at least about five minutes. It kind of felt like I was watching the same thing. I mean, you had chairs, you had kendo sticks, you had violence, but thankfully, Punk and Jericho had built such a good story here, they found the doorway to make it feel fresh. I don't know what that means. Because Jericho was beating Punk up in front of his sister at one point, and that's because the whole crutch of this is that Jericho had found out that CM Punk's dad was a massive alcoholic, and it was only going to be a matter of time before the voice of the voiceless fell down that path too. I oh mean, this was some pretty hard hit stuff. On Raw as well, Jericho had even beaten up CM Punk and poured a bunch of boobs over his head. This is actually quite funny to watch now, because if you read Jericho's book, you know he then slipped on the booze and in his mind ruined the whole segment. 
I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but now that I know, I'll never be able to unsee it. Otherwise, this is just such good stuff, especially when CM Punk dives from the top rope and smashes Jericho with an elbow as he's lying on the announcer's table outside. And at one point, Chris Jericho is going for the walls of Jericho, but CM Punk gets a fire extinguisher and goes, Psh! right into his face and then Punk has the anaconda vice on Jericho but Jericho gets a kendo stick and hits him. It is well put together wrestling. There are some strange bits such as they go for a GTS counter and both kind of fall on the floor and then Jericho hits a code breaker and none of the commentators can decide whether he hit it or not even though he clearly did and it just all comes together for a very satisfying finish. Because Jericho had exposed the turnbuckle earlier because he was a massive doofus and unfortunately it came back to haunt him. Punk threw him into that Hit the GTS, one, two, three. Not only is he still your WWE Champion, but he was about to be your WWE Champion for a long ass time. Just happy days. And then Nikki Bella versus Layla followed. And as we say on a lot of these retro shows, WWE just put it there as filler, and it just irks you and makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Down. And you can just feel that nobody cares too because they're all waiting for the main event and Beth Phoenix is in the back and she's told, oh, you're not allowed to have this match because you're injured. And then Layla comes back for a year injury and you think that would get some kind of reaction, but WWE didn't even give it a chance. The Bellas also do their twin magic thing when Brie gets in there instead of Nikki and this still doesn't work and Layla, after a neck breaker, becomes your new Divas champion. Even I thought about walking out watching this, which I didn't need to do. I could have just hit fast forward, but I'm a professional and I got through it. In many ways though, I suppose it did work as intended because it did reset the table and calm everybody down. And you needed to be at zero for John Cena versus Brock Lesnar in an Extreme Rules match. Cause honestly, it is just Brock trying to kill WWE's favorite son. And do not forget that in 2012, a lot of people just wanted to see John Cena get beaten up. So Brock Lesnar raised his hand and goes, well, I know how to beat people up. I'll do it. And flub me, he did. And this is Pete Brock too, who comes out about the size of a house. And the very first thing he does is he takes Cena down and he just starts pummeling in the head with these shots and even gets his elbow out. Do not pretend otherwise. Much like he was gonna do with Randy Orton a few years later. This is just one man hitting another man and then going, ha, ha, but don't worry, it's just pro wrestling, it's all fake. My ass. The crowd are also going absolutely ballistic too, to the point I can't believe that someone didn't radio the referee and say, look, I know we're about to ruin this by having John Cena winning, change all that, put Brock over, it would have been the right thing to do. It got so intense that the referees tried to stop it, but Brock was having none of that, and given that blood was gushing from Cena's head, Brock took his hand and started wiping it all over his chest, by some kind of insane Viking. This continued too when Lesnar got a steel chain, wrapped it around Cena's legs, and then went and hung him up over the turnbuckle. If you had taken a picture of this and said, oh Simon, I found something from like a prisoner of war camp, I probably would have believed you, although yes, I'm a moron. Realizing then he may actually need a referee to win, he goes over to Charles Robinson on the outside and deadlifts him into the ring. And once again, it is like an adult manhandling a small child. I will go on record, and I'm being a bit of exaggerated here, that no one has come across as more of a legit warrior than Brock Lesnar does in this match. I mean, he just sends a message to everybody watching that you do not mess with this guy. I even went and locked my door. I mean, Brock Lesnar got to turn up at my door, but just in case. The way Lesnar throws himself into stuff too, he charges with so much venom at John Cena at one point that he goes tumbling over the top rope and smacks his knee into the floor. But then he just gets up and goes, ha, 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 I don't care about my knees. It is just something else. So yes, much like their SummerSlam encounter a couple of years later, it was just Lesnar being Lesnar, but Lesnar being Lesnar is good. Unfortunately though, we do have to get to the finish, and I try to justify this in a million different ways, but I just don't think you can. It is dumb. And do not forget the only reason that Brock Lesnar lost here and John Cena won is because Vince McMahon thought, well, Brock Lesnar, he left us high and dry back in 2004, so now he's gotta be punished. Vince. The fans don't care about stuff like that. But yes, after John Cena's pretty much been mutilated the entire time, John Cena gets that steel chain. He punches Brock in the head. That busts him open. He then gives him the AA or the FU onto the stairs and he gets the one, two, three. And look, it does get somewhat of a reaction because nobody can believe it, but still I shake my head to the point that the finish alone is getting it down. And yes, I know in the long run it didn't matter because look at the star that Brock Lesnar became, yet we still had to suffer that time when Triple H beat him too, but I just think we could have done so much more here, especially retroactively, if Brock Lesnar had not only run through John Cena, but had beaten him as well. 
I mean, it is a wins loss business. I mean, why couldn't he have just literally eaten John Cena alive and then crapped him out on Raw? It would have done ratings. And of course, it's still gets an up, but I tell you, if you just made that one change, it would have easily got on a golden one. I mean, it's just so bloody, it's just so intense, it's not PG at all. And it definitely got extra people interested. When you get to that finish, then well, it just sucks. Wrestling nerd. And as ever, we finish with Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer Star Ratings, because you guys really like it and more power to you. Randy Orton versus Kane got three stars. Brodus Clay versus Dolph Ziggler got one star. Cody Rhodes versus The Big Show got 0.25 stars. Dave, you and I do not agree on that one. Sheamus and Daniel Bryan got four stars. Nothing wrong with that. The Rybuck match got 0.25 stars. I've made my things clear. Punk versus Jericho, only three and a half stars. I would have gone up. <laughs> Layla versus Nikki Bella got a dud. <laughs> Actually, it's not nice. They try hard at least. And Cena versus versus Lesnar got four and a half stars. I agree, and it's a five if the right guy wins. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below. Let us know which show you want to have covered on Retro Ups and Downs. Whichever one gets the most upvotes and the most likes goes into the poll. You know how this works. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com. You can read articles about wrestling. You can follow whatculture on Twitter, whatculturewwe. And of course, you can watch more ups and downs right here. If there's a retro one you've missed, what the hell's going on? Sort it out. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you as always for letting me travel back into the past with you. And who knows where we're going to end up next week? Maybe 1997. I just pulled that out my ass.